On this, the October 11, 2023 edition of What the Ship, we look at the top five maritime stories. I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. Welcome to this week's What the Ship. So this episode and this show looks at maritime stories across the spectrum, takes five stories, puts them together, analyzes them, and talks about what the impact is to you, the consumer, the shipper, the person who relies on global shipping on a daily basis. And let's be clear. Picking five stories this week was friggin' tough. It was not easy. I could have done 50 stories. There is so much going on out there. It is ridiculous. But we're going to focus on five key stories. We're going to talk about Israel and Gaza and the impact on global shipping. We're going to talk about the U.S. container sector. We're going to talk about uh, Russia and Ukraine. We're going to talk about low water on the Rhine River, the Mississippi, the Amazon, and at the Panama Canal. And then we're going to talk about an ongoing issue between Frontline and Euronav, two of the biggest tanker companies that are out there. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as as they come out. I've organized these into five stories. You'll see links so you can jump right to the story you want or sit back and relax as we talk about what the ship. Story number one deals with Israel and Gaza. October 7th, we saw the attacks come out of Gaza toward Israel. Israel has since responded. We're looking at specifically the impact on global shipping. And this is marine traffic giving you a snapshot of the situation off the area. You'll see ships still coming into Ashdod and here into Haifa. Uh, traffic has been flowing, but there are a series of delays happening, principally down here in Ashdod. Uh, one of the reasons is increased security. Ships have shifted a little bit further off the coast to get away because of its proximity to Gaza. We've also seen 300,000 Israelis called up into military service. A lot of those Israelis worked in supply chain elements, and that is putting a slowdown on the ability to offload and move cargo in. Israel is utterly dependent on imports for a lot of its material, so keeping these two ports open is essential. Uh, zoom out here for just a little bit. Bigger picture, of course, you see the Suez Canal here, Lebanon to the north. In earlier conflicts, principally with Hezbollah in the north, we've seen anti-ship missiles being used from Lebanon to strike Israeli vessels. We know there is uh, Iranian tankers that are going to be coming through the Persian Gulf, heading up to Syria and other areas. And we know that the USS Ford battle group is in and around the area. I'm going to assume they're in this black hole here, southwest of Cyprus. They're going to try to stay out of the main shipping lanes because the carrier for flight operations is going to be zipping around at pretty high speeds. They don't want to be maneuvering around vessels at all. Let's take a look at some of the stories here. This is from Reuters over at G-Captain. Israeli, Israeli ports open, but at heightened risk, as we talked about. We're seeing that take place. We haven't seen strikes on the ports yet. We've seen them in and around the area. But the, the most southern town, uh, port of Ashkenton, is, is closed right now. This is an oil offload facility. That's been closed. Ashtad, just north of it, is open. Here's a report from Sam Chambers over at Splash 24-7, shipping on alert as Israel's war with Hamas enters the fourth day. Uh, there has been really the only change we've seen in shipping into the area has to do with cruise ships. Cruise ships have announced they are not sailing into the area for obvious reasons. However, commercial vessels are still going in. The question is, do we start seeing delays in loading and offloading? Uh, one of the things that we do know is that Zim, the Israeli-owned container company, has announced that it will fill any shortfall that does appear, and this is one of the reasons why Zim is in creation. Uh, the Israelis know it's a good idea to have a national shipping line so that when war comes, they can rely on it to conduct shipping in and out of the area, very essential during conflicts. Going on here, some other elements. Chevron halts Israel uh, offshore gas production. So uh, this is the Chevron Corporation announced that natural gas coming off the area will be shutting down. Uh, benchmark contracts surge as much as 17% in the most, uh, the most in seven weeks. Chevron was told by Israel to shut down the Tamar offshore natural gas platform because of safety concerns of fighting between Hamas and the Israeli military. Uh, supplies from Leviathan, the nation's other fields, will continue. So this tomorrow is in the very southern reaches of Israel, very close to Gaza. 
And then this story from Bloomberg, what the shock attack on Israel could mean from oil. And they really look at five issues here. Remember, this is the first time Israel has declared war in 50 years. You have to go back to the Yom Kippur War of 1973 to see this happen before. So they're highlighting on five issues here. So number one, sanctions enforcement. The U.S. has sanctioned Iranian oil for a long time now because of Iranian support for terrorist organizations. Iran has been sanctioned. However, according to this, it's widely believed that the oil market, that the U.S. has turned something of a blind eye to sanctions on Iran's oil flows. This goes hand in hand with the freeing of, of currency to Iran. And now we're seeing U.S. kind of turning a blind eye to sanctions against uh, Iran. There is a chance that the U.S. could take aim at this trade. The Islamic Republic currently sells the bulk of its crude exports to China, sending 1.5 billion barrels a day, the most in a decade in August, according to data intelligence from Kepler. It's hard to be sure how much control the U.S. can really exert. Since Iran's sanctions were reimposed in 2018, sales to Chinese comfort customers have increased uh, increasingly been tr uh, transacted in yuan or via trade barriers. So the U.S. is very difficult for the U.S. to sanction this. We saw an example of this when the U.S. diverted a tanker, the Suez Rajan, from its trade and sent it all the way to Houston, Texas. But that tanker sat off Houston, Texas for several months until they convinced an oil company to offload it because many oil companies didn't want to touch it for fear of retribution from the Iranians. Hormuz disturbance did a whole video on the U.S. sending a marine expeditionary unit on board a, a amphibious ready group to the Persian Gulf with the goal and mission of taking units or detachments from that MU, it's a marine battalion, and putting them on ships to serve as naval armed guards. Will we see a Hormuz disturbance? Remember, if, I, if Israel identifies Iran as a key instigator of this attack, one of their outlets to hit is Iranian tankers because the Iranians have been hitting Israeli ships left and right for years now. Go back to the Turks on, uh, attack on ships like Mercer Street. How wide the readout from the conflict of the oil market rests very much on what Israel does in the coming days. Man, we are seeing a shortfall in production, uh, curtailing of production by Russia and OPEC plus, which means that Iranian oil is filling a big gap out there. If you all of a sudden start hitting tankers or tankers become targeted, that is going to force other tankers' cargoes to increase in value. This is going to create shortfalls, and we can see price spikes around the globe. Strategic releases, if the conflict ultimately spirals into something that affects oil supply or boosts oil prices for a prolonged period, it would be a justification for the U.S. government to further sell barrels from its SBR, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Problem is we've depleted the SBR quite a bit. Uh, we've been tapping into that reserve, <clears throat> which is all crude oil, for a long time. So there's a question about how deep you can go to that. And if history is a guide, as they talk about here, Turmoil in this region in recent times hasn't been a catalyst for structural moves higher in, in oil prices. Trades, uh, traders want proof that the disturbances are material for supply. During the height of the tanker war, you still saw tankers moving out of the Persian Gulf, even though Iran and Iraq were throwing missiles at each other and hit over 100 ships you still saw oil moving. So it's going to take a lot for this to be done. Finally, last story, just to clarify on something, because this, this is reports out here. The White House may send two carriers to show support for Israel. The Ford is scheduled to come back. The Dwight D. Eisenhower battle group is ramped up, ready to go. It'll be sailing probably, if not this week, next week. I just saw that a U.S. Uh, Navy MSC oiler sortied from Norfolk. It's probably going to take position out in the mid-Atlantic to refuel the Eisenhower Battle Group as it transits. This is a scheduled relief. Now, what they're probably going to do is relieve in place. In other words, they sometimes they'll gap coverage in an area. They would send the Ford back as the Eisenhower comes in because it's not needed. But with Russia, Ukraine, with Israel and Gaza, they won't do that. So for a brief period of time, you will see two carriers in the Mediterranean. Big question is, do they release Ford to come back home? That is the question we're going to have to wait and see that no one has answered yet. So we may see a heightened U.S. military presence in the Mediterranean, especially if they want to leave a carrier on station, because carriers, while they can refuel and replenish, do need downtime. And so you may want two carriers in the Mediterranean to keep a constant aerial surveillance 
picture up. I think one of the things you'll see the Eisenhower and the Ford battle groups doing is putting up their E2D Hawkeyes, get a big surveillance picture of what's happening, monitor that situation off the Gaza coast, monitor what's going on off of Lebanon, and really track uh, a big picture of what is going on in the region. All right, let's go ahead and jump to story number two. So one of the things we do at What's Going On With Shipping is look at commercial shipping in detail. Uh, we been kind of diverted by wars and conflicts, but our bread and butter here is looking at commercial shipping. And so I want to take a look at a report out by Greg Miller over at Freight Waves, U.S. container imports still rising, topping pre-COVID levels. September imports up 8% versus 2019, 9% versus 2018, and 15.5% versus 2017. Uh, some great charts here to take a look at. This is from Descartes. Here's the graph of U.S. container import volumes. And one of the things this graph shows is something abnormal over the past five years. So if you look at the past four years, 2019 through 2022, when you come into September, usually you're starting to see a dip downward. And all those four years, we've seen a dip downward from August to September, except this year, 2023, we're seeing a gradual rise. And that rise has been going on since February. Slight dip in June, but we're seeing that gradual rise. However, once you hit October and you hit the peak in October, that's usually the point when it goes off the cliff. And based on data I've been seeing, we can expect to see that. We can expect to see that happening. Here are the 2023 imports versus pre-COVID. So this is looking at 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2023 is still kind of following that track, but in a much flatter line than we typically see. Uh, we're not quite seeing those kind of dips and troughs. One of the things we're seeing here is U.S. containerized imports from China. As of September 2023, we saw a huge decrease back in the early part of the year. That coincided with a dip we saw early in the year. The question is, does this fall off the cliff? And I think we're about to see it fall off the cliff when we come into October. What's not tracking with this is freight rates. Freight rates are continually falling. We're seeing freight rates continually falling. And I think there's a lot at play here why freight rates are falling. Uh, we're starting to see the introduction of these new vessels coming on that were ordered during the height of COVID. Lots of tonnage coming online, much more fuel efficient, much cheaper to operate these vessels. Uh, and therefore they're getting rid. We're starting to see the scrapping of vessels. About 100,000 TEUs of container capacity has been scrapped. That's 10 times what was done last year, but a drop in the bucket in what needs to be done to keep the container fleet at a manageable level. So Mike Schuller over G-Captain followed up on this with this report, U.S. import uh, cargo volumes hit 2023 peak. Uh, some great data in here looking at the monthly imports of TEUs in millions. So when you start looking at this, 2023 is in the light blue. Uh, the dark gray here is 2022. And you see we're kind of below here throughout the year, the 2022 levels uh, where we go. But forecast habits spiking up a little bit in November, December over 2022. I would argue 2022 is an aberration because you saw it fall off a cliff. I mean, dived off a cliff. Uh, and that had a lot to do with the reopening after COVID. And so there's still a little bit of restructuring going on here. When you look at the total imports in years, since 2008, it's been on a gradual, nice, steady in climb. You have the aberration of COVID that jumps up there. And now you're seeing 2023 right at about 22.1 million, which is a bit of a flat line from the years before, but a gradual increase. It is not increasing at this level that we saw. And I think that's an important element to go. This is all from the National Retail Federation that Mike is referencing in here. Meanwhile, the carriers are battening down their hatches ahead of a potential worst slack season on record. Uh, Mike Wackett over at Lodestar, great follow if you want to follow someone, is taking a look at it. He's seeing what rates are doing. So for the Asia uh, to Northern European rates in particularly, we're seeing changes. Uh, he's talking about CMA, CGM, FAK rates will increase to $1,000 per 20 foot and $1,800 per 40 foot. Uh, this compares with Hopog Lloyd, which is right about there. We're seeing these hike increases in the short term rates. Really important to see the Asia to West Mediterranean 
also seeing that. And he goes on to talk about history tells us that during a downturn, container lines only achieve a modest percentage of increase, a good result being that the carriers realize 50% of their ask. Furthermore, many volume shippers will all have already obtained three-month deals from carriers at rates far less than the new rates. And that's the big, big issue here. Most of these charts you see that talk about rates are talking about short-term rates. Most ocean carriers book in long-term rates early in the year for a year, or they're doing three-month rates to really get themselves in. But one of the things that we have been seeing is that Asia to Europe and Europe to America rates have been coming down. They were high for a long time, and that had a lot to do with the repositioning of containers going not from Asia to the West Coast of the United States, but from Asia to Europe and the East Coast and Gulf Coast of the United States. Then you see this, container shipping, analysts warn of severe downturn as new capacity hits the waves. Again, that's what we've been talking about, this new capacity that's coming in. That's going to change. A lot of these vessels are going to be used. If you look at the ships that are coming out, there's really three main uh, areas that are coming out. Small feeder vessels for intra-Asia. You have about three to 8,000 box ships. These are good overall size vessels for use in almost any trade route, but really locally uh, uh, routes. And then the new Neo Panamax vessels. These are ships that can go either through the Suez Canal or the new lane of the Panama Canal. And that's really impacting shipping a lot. The other story that dropped this week, which was a bombshell of a story, and I, I'm telling you, I could do hours talking about this, is that the liner services, the big, huge, nine shipping companies, uh, nine of the 10, they control about 83% of all the capacity, are anxiously waiting on Washington's reaction to the European Union announcing that the container lines are no one no longer going to be under an antitrust exemption. This is huge. Uh, th this story in itself requires an entire separate video, which I'll be doing. So what do we mean by the shipping alliances? So back in the 90s, you started seeing container lines, particularly the smaller ones, form alliances. They would get together and do kind of route sharing. So, you know, when you fly commercially on an airplane, sometimes you'll fly American, but you'll notice it's flown by a subsidiary or, or another company that's doing it. Very similar here. And so what you saw was the creation of these alliances and the smaller ones were kind of teaming up to get more capacity to challenge the bigger ones. Well, what we've seen fall out from this since the 90s to the modern day is a lot of the smaller companies and even larger ones, Hanjin, for example, in 2017, fell out. And what you wound up with was three big alliances. The 2M alliance, which is the biggest, formed in 2015 with Maersk and MSC, Mediterranean Shipping Company. They represent over 35% of the total capacity, close to 40%. Now, they have announced that they're dissolving as of 2025. Then you have the Ocean Alliance, that is CMA, CGM, French company, Costco, which is the Chinese overseas shipping company, and Evergreen. Uh, those are both uh, mainland China and, and Taiwan. Ironically, Taiwan and China are allied together. They came together and formed the Ocean Alliance. And then you have the Alliance. This is Hapog Lloyd. This is ONE. This is HMM. This is Yang Min. They came together. And each of these three controlled roughly about 25 to 35% of the container capacity out there. Now, they don't all share everything together. So Maersk and MSC don't share everything. They'll share routes together. And this allows them to not compete against each other and, and, and maximize their vessels. Now, there's a lot of allegations that this is a cartel, that this is illegal, this is antitrust. Uh, there was an investigation about this back in 2017. Uh, it was dropped by the U.S. Justice Department in 2019. When the shipping uh, supply chain crisis happened, there was allegations that the shipping alliances were artificially inflating the rates. This is when you saw spot rates go as high as 25,000. This led to the Federal Maritime Commission, the U.S. organization that oversees international shipping, getting a lot more power through OSRA, the Ocean Shipping Reform Act. And now we're seeing the European Union, Union kicking in. And the European Union, along with the Federal Maritime Commission and China, are the ones that allow the container companies to operate these alliances. But now with the container shipping lines losing their antitrust exemption, 
This opens the door. This is a Reuters story over at G Captain talking about it. Uh, first adopted in tw 2009, the consortia block exemption regulation allows liner shipping operators with a combined market share below 30% to team up to provide joint cargo transport services. Uh, but it goes on here, and this is what the EU said, quote, given the small number and profile of consortia falling within the scope of the CBER, this brings limited compliance cost savings to carriers and plays a secondary role in carriers' decision to cooperate. Furthermore, over the evaluation period, the CBER was no longer enabling smaller carriers to cooperate among each other and offer alternative services in competition with larger carriers. Basically, what the EU is saying is these alliances have become so big that they shut out anybody from getting in because what these companies do in these alliances is not allow new companies to come in. There is no way to break in because you have three behemoths, the Alliance, the Ocean Alliance, and 2M. And so now the EU is saying they're removing this protection. And this, according to Mike Schuller of a G Captain, creates a period of uncertainty. I would say it creates a massive period of uncertainty. There is no telling how this goes. There is already a push in the United States to do antitrust lawsuits against the major shipping firms for what happened during the supply chain crisis. We have seen an accelerated number of cases going to the Federal Maritime Commission. The FMC is receiving a plus up. There is new legislation to further empower the FMC. And this could lead to the breakup of the big alliances. We already see the 2M alliance coming apart, but that's basically coming apart because both those companies are so huge. You could see a reshuffling where Maersk and, and MSC become new alliance partners with smaller firms. What this means for you is more competition on the high seas, which sounds great, but not exactly, because what happens here is these companies share these routes, and so you're getting guaranteed service in a lot of places. So if you're in Australia or New Zealand, for example, this is a losing proposition for you because now companies are not gonna to wanna to go down and do multiple routes and stop at multiple ports. You may get a ship that comes into New Zealand or in Australia and that's it. Uh, it's going to be a bit of a problem because if you don't have the guaranteed cargo on board where you can share, then there's these routes become unprofitable and companies are not gonna run unprofitable routes. They're just gonna eliminate them, especially with new ships and excess capacity. They're just not gonna run at a loss. These companies have tasted profits and they like them. Big profits. So this spells a lot of problem. I am not a fan of the big alliances in any means. I do think we need to do something here. My fear is that with the removal of the antitrust protection, that we swing very hard against the alliance companies, break them up. The World Shipping Council, which is the advocacy group for the alliances, has said what a problem this is. this could be. Uh, I agree with them. One of the few times I will agree with the World Shipping Council. I think we need to have very thought out and rational actions before we start breaking up these big alliances. These are not monopolies. Uh, they do compete against each other. The problem is they've gotten very big and they are shutting out competition from smaller companies. And that's the real big issue here. All right, let's go ahead and do our next story. Our next story takes us to Russia, Ukraine. Like, we don't have enough war on this planet. We have this one has been going on since February of last year. The UK warns Russia may target civilian ships in Black Sea humanitarian corridor. So, real quick recap. Russia invades Ukraine in February of 2022. I have argued repeatedly that this was all naval and maritime related. I understand what people see about this, but one of the key things they wanted to do is grab the northern shore of the Sea of Azov, not just to create a land bridge to Crimea, to Russia. They already had that with the Kerch Strait Bridge, but to create the Sea of Azov as a, a Russian lake so that the Ukrainians could not interdict coastal ships coming out of the Don River at Rostov. Well, Russia cut Ukraine off from the outside world, sneezing, uh, seizing Snake Island, putting their military out there. But the Ukrainians countered. They took back Snake Island. They sank the Moskva. They have forced the Black Sea Fleet to retreat from Sevastopol. And they initially had a Black Sea Grain Initiative that allowed Ukraine to bring grain out of the northern Ukrainian ports in and around Odessa, but that expired in July. And what's happening now is Ukraine through the Danube ports, but also 
getting ships to come into Odessa in those areas to basically, quote unquote, run a blockade. There's no blockade there. But Russia can potentially strike at these vessels. And the problem is how many vessels are going to be coming in. They tend to be smaller, older vessels, which are easier to insure because understand if you get hit in a wartime environment, you need specific insurance for that. Your normal ship insurance doesn't cover that. Adding here on this story, NATO has finally decided to form a minesweeping force to clear the Black Sea route. I have been talking about this forever. I know Turkey has closed the Turkish Straits to warships. I got it. I know the Montreux Convention. I've read it. Believe me, I know a lot about this stuff. However, what Turkey specifically said was they requested nations not ask permission to sortie ships through the Turkish Straits into the Black Sea who are not Black Sea nations. However, that's warships. Minesweepers are technically, while they're warships, they're not offensive warships. They're defensive. And I've been talking about standing mining, uh, standing naval group, uh, minesweeping group one and two going up there. That's not what this is. Instead, what they're going to do is take Bulgaria, Romania, and Turkish minesweepers, form them together to provide minesweeping in the area, which is a great start. Don't get me wrong, because there was a potential mine explosion on a ship off of the Danube in Romanian waters. Now, this is subsequently determined not to be a mine, or, or there's a lot of debate about what this really was. However, these mines are going to break loose. Could it conceivably be Ukrainian mines breaking loose? And that's, that's a good possibility, understand. Uh, so it's not clear these are Russian mines, Ukrainian mines that are floating loose, but we do know mines are floating loose in the area, and they head down toward the Turkish Strait. Add to it, Russia has decided to lift their ban on exporting diesel. Did a whole video on this and why this was important. Remember, Russian diesel is under a price cap. It cannot be hauled on ships for more than $100 a barrel, or else they face issues from the G7 and the EU, but not exactly. What the G7 and the EU does is they leverage insurance companies not to insure vessels that are carrying Russian diesel that's over $100 per barrel. Well, what Russia has done is created their own new shipping companies. And, uh, in fact, I have that here. There we go. Uh, Russia has created its own new shipping companies, and they're seeking insurance from these new insurance companies. And so they're getting around that. This is what's known as the dark fleet. And so Safkomflot, which is the big Russian state uh, shipping firm, is creating these new little shipping firms in areas like uh, the United Arab Emirates and Cyprus uh, to do their hauling for it. They're creating new insurance companies to get war risk insurance and allow them to move cargo. So they, they are back out there hauling diesel. Remember, the G7 in the EU wanted to hurt Russia by, by, by lowering the price of fuel, $60 for crude, $100 for diesel, setting that cap in place. But they still wanted the crude and the, oil and the diesel going out because if not, it would cause inflation and global disruptions in the fuel market. And this is a really hard thing to do. Then you add this scenario to it. Finland says outside activity likely damaged a gas pipeline. So this is harking back to Nord Stream at this time. Uh, telecoms, cable, uh, uh, gas pipeline. This is underwater warfare. It seems as if the world has just woken up to the idea that there are things on the bottom of the ocean that are really important. I, I don't know why we, we were just learning about this. First underwater cable was laid in 1859 from Canada to Ireland. Uh, this has been the norm throughout history. World War I, the Royal Mail Service fished up three German cables, underwater cables, and sawed and cut them in half, which angered the Royal Navy because they wanted to tap them because they had the German codes. This is a style of warfare that we're seeing being done. Uh, the question is, who did this? I am not getting into this. I don't know who did Nord Stream. There is so much evidence out there pointing at different people. I have no idea. But what we do know is that Finland is reporting that there was an explosion that damaged the pipeline. Was it a natural uh, explosion caused by the pipeline itself? Or was there uh, charges laid down there by who? We don't know. But, you know, the fact that Finland is just coming into NATO 
raises a lot of question. Uh, also, Finland and Estonia um, are going to take months to get this done. This comes on the heels of an agreement between Estonia and Finland to sign a new Green Corridor Agreement, which is re uh, cementing the relationship between Finland and the Baltic states. Two last weird stories that are related to this is this one over in Maritime Executive. A Chinese-owned container ship reaches Kaliningrad after a, a North Sea route passage. So this is a, a vessel, the New New Polar Bear. And if you look closely at this picture, you can tell they just painted that name on there and not very well. But this is a Chinese-owned container ship that's coming through that Northern Sea route. That This is through the Bering Sea, north of Russia back down. It is substantially shorter. Uh, Russia has been trying to get this route open for a long time. And one of the things they're advocating is you don't need to be an ice strengthened ship to do this. Uh, this is a potential big thing for Russia. This way they can bypass things like the Suez Canal, the South China Sea, the Malacca Straits. Uh, this demonstrates that Russia can really move cargo between East Asia and Europe in a new route. And Russia sees this as a cash revenue system. Last story here has to do with ship to ship transfers of oil coming in. This is from Splash 24 seven. Egypt is emerging as the new hub for these transfers. Previously, it was off the coast of Spain. It was off Greece, but now Egypt is serving as this ship to ship hub. This is a big problem because these ship to ship transfers uh, are very dangerous because they're being done without tugs, without the proper environmental controls around them. A lot of these ships are not coming into port, which means they're not being inspected. They're not getting port state uh, controls on them. This has been a facet we've been seeing in the Russian oil and diesel trade for a long time. All of this is stemming from Russia-Ukraine war. This is impacting grain. This is impacting oil. This is impacting diesel. And it has an impact on you. All right, let's go to story number four. So did a video not too long ago about the Mississippi. I actually did two of them, uh, one video myself, and then I went on Freight Waves along with Pat Chambers from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. I'll have the links above. You can take a look at them. But we're seeing issues with climate and, and particularly low water, and it's not just the Mississippi River. So water isn't rising on the Mississippi, but rates have steadied for now. That's because October is a low rate month. It's a low freight month. You don't see a lot coming through. However, if this water level does not increase by November and into December, that's when more freight starts coming down. And if that doesn't happen and you're starting to get winter crop out, and, and again, one of the issues we're seeing here is that we've seen a diminishing of freight coming down the Mississippi, which means that grain is probably being stored in silos and granaries throughout the United States. If it cannot come out, then as new crops are harvested, there's gonna be no place to put that. And so you can have spoilage. This creates insurance problems. Uh, you can't just replace, you know, a 15 tow barge with a rail car. I mean, it takes two and a half 100 car trains to replace that. It takes over a thousand trucks to replace that. And understand south of St. Louis, they usually run 40 barge tows. Uh, and what we're seeing now in the river is a reduction in the number of barges. We're seeing a reduction in the draft of the barges from 11 feet down to up to nine and a half feet, which diminishes the amount of cargo you can put in there. This is creating havoc in our ability to get grain out to marketplace. And this is creating a new historic low. We have not seen the Mississippi at this level of, of, of depth uh, in its history. And understand, it is not locked in, in, in south of St. Louis. North of St. Louis, you have locks and dams. That controls the upper Mississippi River. When you have enough rain in there, that water flows down, fills up. But on the lower Mississippi River Valley, we're not seeing the rain, especially on the tributaries out in the west. And that is causing the Mississippi River to flow down. That means Coast Guard has to get out there, reposition aids of navigation. The Army Corps of Engineers is out there with equipment that desperately needs replacement. Why is it we're not funding building new bar, new uh, dredges for the Mississippi River with some of that infrastructure money? Pete Buttigieg, hello, Pete. Pete, do you hear me? We need to spend some money on infrastructure, dredges, and aids of navigation and Coast Guard assets on the Mississippi River. But this isn't isolated. In Germany, seeing the same thing. We're seeing low river waters on the Rhine. Uh, low waters hampering shipping on most of the river 
south of Duisburg and Cologne, including the choke point of Cobb. The same thing we saw last year, but again, this is magnified. The Rhine is becoming a big issue. Understand the Rhine connects to the Maine, which connects to the Danube. So a lot of grain that's coming out of Ukraine is also coming through these canal systems out to Rotterdam. It's not going to be able to come out because if the Rhine is low, you can't fully load barges and ships coming out of that area. This is a big problem we're seeing. And as if that's not enough, the Amazon is having the same issue. Now, fortunately, it hasn't hit southern South America, the Piranha, the Rio Plot. But the Amazon in Brazil is key because, again, a lot of agriculture comes out of the Amazon. The interior of Brazil, the I-95, I-5 of Brazil is the Amazon. And when that goes dry, you're not bringing stuff out from the interior because they do not have the road and rail system. And then finally, Panama Canal. So October, uh, talking to people in the canal right now, they have not seen this before, such low levels at the Panama Canal. Right now, Gatun Lake, the freshwater lake, is at 79.9 feet. They have not had any appreciable rain at all. This has limited the draft of the Neo Panamax vessels to 44 feet. Uh, the max depth you can go in those locks is 50, but no ship goes to 50 feet. Uh, usually it's around 47, 48 feet. So you have this reduction taking place. Uh, when you look at the water levels uh, in October, they have not changed at all. And more importantly, when you look at the average waterfalls for the past five years, October, you're supposed to be at 86 feet. We're at 79.9 feet. And if you look at past years here, uh, the past years, the lowest you go is back to 2019 at 81.7 feet. Other years, 86, 87 feet, we're at 79. That is a big problem. And it's going to impact ships going through the canal, which means that if you're using that Neo Panamax lane, you're bringing those big, large container ships that are bypassing the West Coast of the United States because of everything from the ILWU contract renegotiation. Now they have a bankruptcy issue. Uh, they want to go through that big lane on the, on the Panama Canal. You've got to reduce the loads on those ships because you can't be drawing more than 40, uh, uh, 44 feet which means either you're not loading as much in Asia or when you arrive at the Panama Canal, you got to take boxes off, rail them across and load them on the other side, which increases your handling costs. Or you load them on the big, massive, ultra-large container vessels out of Asia heading to Europe and then coming from Europe across to the east and Gulf Coast of the United States. This issue is, you know, I, I don't argue about global warming, global cooling. I'm just telling you what exactly is happening. And we don't have water in the Mississippi. We don't have water in the Rhine. We don't have water in the Amazon. And we don't have water in the Panama Canal. And that is happening because it's not raining. And that's climate. And that's the simple measure here. And we depend on that for trade. All right, let's go to our last story. So one of the reasons I love ocean shipping is some of the personalities in it. And man, you don't get a better, better personality than this dude right here, John Fredrickson. Fredrickson is a legend in, in the oil tanker market. And he has been working behind the scenes to negotiate a merger between two of the biggest oil tanker companies out there, Euronav and Frontline. Understand, for a long time, for a long time, 70s, 80s, and prior to that, oil tankers were dominated by what were called the Seven Sisters. Those were the big oil companies, Chevron, Shell, uh, BP, uh, Exxon, Mobil, Amoco, all the big ones were out there. So they controlled over 50% of the oil tankers out there. And then you had these other oil tanker companies that came out that kind of filled in when you needed them. They were kind of the U-Haul of tankers. So you had a lot of Greek tanking, uh, Greek firms come out. This is Onassis. This is a whole batch of guys that came out. Well, in the 70s and 80s, you had a series of very high profile oil tanker wrecks. And more importantly, the oil companies realized, man, you know, it's a mistake to put our company's name in the name of the tankers. So when Amoco Cadiz and Exxon Valdez goes aground, people are so upset about it, they boycott Amoco and Exxon stations. So the oil companies largely, not entirely, but largely got out of the oil transportation business. And now these independent oil companies grew in size. And 
guys like Fredrickson has, has really seen the rise of the oil tankers. They've built these big, huge firms. And what Fredrickson wanted to do is bring together the second and fourth largest oil tanker firms together to create the largest in combining Euronav and Frontline. But he ran into problems because a lot of these firms are privately owned. They're really hard to do. And even with corporate ownership and stockholders, it's tough to do. But finally, what we're seeing coming out of this is Fredrickson is making a move here. And one of the things he's trying to do is, is consolidate the very large crude carriers. These are the massive super tankers. These are the big 2 million barrel uh, super tankers out there together. And what we see is this story here. Uh, Fredrickson's Frontline becomes the largest pure play tanker company. Uh, Frontline has announced its acquisition of two dozen very large crude carriers from Euronav, solidifying its position as the largest publicly listed pure play tanker company at a critical time in the tanker market. The acquisition comes as part of a resolution in Frontline's year-long deadlock with CMB, this is the company maritime Belge, uh, over control of the Belgian tanker company Euronav. Under the agreement, Frontline will acquire 20 eco VLCCs, average age of 5.3 years, really good buy right here. These, these are really good ships. For a total purchase price of $2.35 billion, that is a steal at that point. In exchange, Frontline and Fredrickson's aligned uh, Famitown Finance Limited have agreed to sell their 26.12% stake in Euronav. This is part of their effort to buy Euronav to get a controlling interest and merge them together at a price of $18.43 a share. Proceeds from this sale will help to fund the acquisition. So this obviously started a run on stocks of Euronav because everybody was selling it because they knew what was happening here. Frontline stocks went up. So when you look at the economics here, this is Frontline over the course of its year. Now, I should mention tankers are really low in their in their valuation today. This is a historic. So right now we're looking at 19.94 uh, cents for Frontline stock. If you go back to the historic high back in 2008, over $300. It's crazy. But if you come here just at the five years, you'll see Frontline is on a, a upward trajectory growth. And in particularly here since 2020, uh, you see it on that rise. If you look at Euronav, uh, their max uh, is the same here. Uh, it dips a little bit in the 2018s, 2019s. But what we're seeing right now is this really big uptick. Early October, it was down to $14.77. Now it's jumped back up to $17.76. And this is part of consolidation in the tanker industry. We're seeing it in container ships, seeing it in bulkers, seeing it in the tanker industry. Not unusual to see it. Bigger tanker companies are coming in. This puts Fredrickson really in the position to move crude oil VLCCs, very large crude carriers, move crude oil. They don't move uh, clean product, diesel and gasoline. So that puts him into this position. So let's wrap this together. It's been a long video, and I apologize. Usually we do this in 30 minutes, but there's a lot to talk about here. So five stories that spread across the spectrum. And each of these stories, by the way, I think really impact you. If you go to Israel and Gaza, uh, the potential for that conflict to spread outside the border to Iran will have ramifications in the oil market. Why does Fredrickson want to get crude carriers right now? Because this is a potential for him. He sees that happening. The container sector. Uh, containers are moving in larger numbers than we've seen, gradually up upticking, but the rates are down. Rates are down quite a bit, so cargo is moving. That's right-shifting the economy over three years, I would argue. Uh, when you have a downturn in the economy, people want to buy cheaper goods. A lot of those cheaper goods come from overseas, so we're seeing it, but get ready for the cliff to happen. We're going to see all that come down with numbers, and the question is, when does it come back up? I, you know, It's going to be first quarter of 2024 till you see those numbers start coming back up. Uh, go over to Russia, Ukraine. Same thing. We're seeing the impact in the bulk market, the grain market, uh, with Russia, with Ukraine trying to get grain out with the potential of attacks on those vessels, escalating war risk insurance. The fact that Eastern European countries don't want any more Ukrainian grain in their country. This is all having an impact on grain. Add to the fact that we're seeing droughts on major rivers that are used to export grain. That can mean higher prices for 
food out there and you're shuffling grain from further distances around it, you know all of a sudden does the very southern ports in south america along the rio de plata become very important does australia become important for getting grain out does western pacific uh west coast of canada become important all of that plays a major issue here in that movement and then, of course, the oil coming out is another big thing with Russia on the oil market. And then you wrap it up with Fredrickson in, in the shifting moves in the tanker industry. All of this is at play, which makes the shipping market and shipping itself fascinating to watch. And one of the reasons I do what I do. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Sorry for the long episode. We'll break this down in parts so that you can digest these. Until our next episode, this is Sal signing off.